This is a place that's been set aside for the glory of God. Many people have been saved here. Many people have given their lives to the Lord. Many people have been baptized in the name of Jesus, have received the gift of the Holy Ghost, and they're on their way to heaven. Praise God. How many are on their way to heaven this morning? Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. So let's magnify and worship the name of Jesus today. God bless you. Oh! 
Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak but he is strong. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so.
on, tell them you love them today. I love you. I love you, Jesus. I love you. With my whole heart. I love you. Say it with meaning. I love you. I love you. With your most high God. I Jesus, yes, we tell him we love him, but you know it all has to do with what we give him, how we love him from our hearts, praise God, how we live for him, our life, everything, praise God, praise God. That's what love is all about, that's what it's all about, and our God loves when we love him, he loves when we praise him, we, he loves when we give him glory and honor, oh, that's what we were made for. We were actually made to worship the Lord. That's our main, main purpose. The whole duty of man is to fear God and to keep his commandments. And I tell you what, it feels good to keep the Lord's commandments. Praise God, because it does something on the inside, and it makes a difference on the outside. And it draws people to us so that we can go ahead and worship him together. Praise God, and that's what it's all about. Hallelujah. Praise God. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Our God is a good God. And we're glad for everyone that is here. We know we have some visitors. And we want you to feel very comfortable in coming in and being able to worship the Lord, to love him from the bottom of your heart. You know, there's no set way to, to know how to worship him. What it is is you just love him from the bottom of your heart. You just tell him you love him. And, and as you do that, you will feel his presence as it comes closer because he's telling you also that he loves you. Praise God. Hallelujah. What a wonderful Savior we serve this morning. Praise God. At this time, we're going to uh, just kind of go to the Lord in prayer, but we're going to also get ready to hear from the Word of God as well. And uh, we have some great things that's in store. We have a new church building that we've been looking at, and uh, things have been moving along, and uh, we just want to just thank God for the things that we're already seeing that's taking place. Praise God. And uh, we can always look for good things in our God because he has good things in store for us. And so uh, let's go to him in prayer. I know we have some that uh, are not feeling very well. Um, let's remember the Nicely family. Uh, they had a trip to the hospital last night. And so we've uh, been praying for them. And we wanted to just pray that God would just do a special blessing in their lives today. So if we can remember the Nicely family, okay. Um, and then uh, I know we, there were some other prayer requests that we have been praying about. Uh, let's just continue to lift them up before the Lord. I know we have some that are still looking for work. Um, and we need to pray that God will work that out as well because he's able. Praise God. He, he's able to do it and he des desires to do it. Okay. And so let's, uh, let's see what God is going to do. If we could stand right now and as a church, let's go before the Lord and uh, let's see what he will do for us today. Okay. Oh, Lord, we love you and we thank you so much for your goodness and your love, your mercy, and your kindness, oh, God. You have been so real and true to us, Lord, and you loved us with all of your heart, God, by giving your very best to us, oh, Lord. And so, Lord, we want to give you our best, oh, God. And, Lord, you have accepted our praise. And, Lord, we have more yet that's going to happen in this building, oh, Lord. We look forward to hearing from what you're going to say to us today, Lord. Oh, Lord, but we ask that you would remember the Nicely family, God, they need you right now, Lord. You know, Lord, that 
It's been an ongoing battle here, Lord, with certain things, God. And, Lord, we know that you're able to help them. You're able to take care of the situation, O oh Lord. And so, Lord, we ask, Lord, with your wisdom and your kindness, O oh Lord, that you would touch them, O oh Lord, and make a difference, O oh God. You know what needs to be done there, Lord. Lord, we have some that are looking for work, O oh Lord. And I know, God, that you care about those things. And so, God, let their search come to an end, O oh Lord. Give them, O oh Lord, the needs and the desires of their hearts, O oh God. O oh Lord, and would you do a work in this place today, Lord. Touch hearts, O oh Lord. Change lives, O oh God. And make us new, Lord, like you want us to be, O oh Lord. In your wonderful and holy and precious name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. You may be seated. And at this time, Brother Eves is coming to speak to us from the word of the Lord. How many are ready to hear what the Spirit has to say to the church? Praise God. God bless you. Amen. It is good to know the Lord, isn't it? If you don't know him today, I encourage you to get to know him before you leave this place. He's not that hard to get to know. He's so easy to talk to. He's such an amazing God that there are times that sometimes I wonder even myself, why, why, oh Lord, with you being so amazing, did you, did you care about me? What is it about me that you care about? Why, why in the world would you come so far from your throne to this place and die for me? What, what is it about me that you love? Today I want to preach to you a message just simply titled, The Love of a God. I, I, I know how much the Lord cares. I've been in the places in which I've seen the Lord move in mighty ways. I remember one time as I sat there and, and, and seen the Lord, um, walked into this hospital room and was the manager of a Hardee's, and there was a lady there who I worked with, and her father-in-law was dying, and I asked her specifically, I said, would you like for me to come by and pray for him? They weren't of the church, and uh, she said, would you please? And so as I left my shift that afternoon, I, I went to the hospital, and I went into the room, and there he lay, and his kidneys had failed, his body had failed, his his liver was failing. Every, every bodily function was failing within him. And so his family was there and walked over there in a very sweet spirit. And I asked the wife of the man, I said, would you like for me to pray? And she said, sure. The family excused themselves. And we began to pray. Little known to me that they were Pentecostals. They weren't quite of the truth, but they had a little bit of it began to pray for the man in the bed and she began to speak in tongues over there in the corner and wasn't long that he began to speak in tongues. Now he wasn't able to respond to anything the doctors had but when Jesus moved into the room he began to respond. Got a tap on my shoulder and I turned around and there was a guy standing there it was one of the son-in-laws one of the grandson-in-laws actually and he said I'm going to tell you right now if he dies tonight I'm going to sue you and I'm going to sue your church. I said, well, I'll just let you know right now he's not dying tonight. Of course, I was young and 20 back then. I don't know if I'd make that same statement today. I left. As I walked out of the hospital, I said, please, God, let me be right. I walked back in the next day to visit with him. He was setting up. He had his teeth in, his glasses on, he was shaved, his hair was combed. And when he looked at me, he said, you were the one that called Jesus into my room yesterday. His kidneys were 100%. His liver was 100%. No more heart failure. <laughs> he walked out of that place, raked his yard, burned his leaves, and lived two more years. Let me tell you something about who God is. God loves us. God cares for us. There is not a thing in this world that my God doesn't care for you. 
Amen. My Lord cares for you. Praise the Lord. If you have your Bibles today, we're going to turn to three different scriptures. Very quick reading. They're not going to be of anything substantial reading, but just very quickly, if you'd stand with me for just a moment. Genesis chapter 1, verse number 2. Then John chapter 3, verse number 16. And then John chapter 11, verse 35. Genesis chapter 1, verse number 2, the Bible says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. John 3, 16 says, and most of us can quote it, For God so loved the world that He gave. Everybody say gave. He gave. His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And John 11 and 35, Jesus wept. A very simple scripture, but a very strong scripture. Brother Paris, would you pray? Everybody said amen. You can be seated. I will do my absolute best to be time conscious. I know we have a business meeting afterwards. But I do believe that the way that this message came to me, that the Lord wants me to share something with you this morning. I was in my bed at night, tossed and turned for hours over four different thoughts in my head that the Lord, I felt, you know, I, a direction I wanted to go. And last night in a dream, as I dreamed about uh, wanting to feel love from a father and wanting to feel love from an individual, as in my dream, it was so profound as, as a young man that I was reaching out to this man as, as a child saying, I just want you to love me. This morning, this, this, this thought came into my mind. As the family was getting ready, I jotted my notes down because I feel like there's something special in this service today. The earth was without form and void. The Bible tells us that God doesn't create anything void. For sur- so there was something about the earth that had caused it to become without form and void. And, and the Bible says that the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters and there was darkness in the deep. And He said, let there be light. And there was light. Out of, out of nowhere where, where there seemeth to be no way to see, all of a sudden the light shined and, and people were able, or, or not people, but God was able to see the things that were there. The creation in which we preach about and the creation in which we speak about is such a, a miraculous thing inside of itself that if, if you could just understand the care that God had put into the creation, we would be more mindful of the things that are out there and we wouldn't be so quick to, to, to dismiss some of the things that people talk about saying, let's save our planet or be careful you know, about the birds having a place to live and the squirrels having a place to live. We wouldn't be so selfish with making sure that our life was comfortable that we would understand. You see, because God took such a careful uh, careful design in how he created the earth. Uh, he set the earth on an axis at a perfect 23 and a, and a half degree angle so that there would be seasons and times and things that would take place. Uh, and we're just far enough away from the sun, my brother, that, that we wouldn't all burn up, but just close enough to it that we wouldn't all freeze. Uh, if we were just one degree closer or one degree further away, we wouldn't be able to survive. We used to think that the earth was flat. We wouldn't sail across the ocean because if we did sail across the ocean, we would fall off the edge. But if they had just read their scripture, the Bible said that the circle of the earth is his footstool. 
that God hang the stars upon nothing. All of the things that transpired in the creation, he spoke it into existence. He spun it out there. He said, let there be. It was good and so on and so forth. But when he came to the sixth day, in which he reached into a handful of dust, and he formed man out of the dust of the ground. He made the pinky toe. He made the hairs of your head. He made your eyeball. He carved out your nostrils. He created your teeth. He stood you upright. He made your brain. He did all of this. But he went a step further than just creating you with his very own hand. But he breathed into your nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Meaning that you have the ability to make decisions and things that other animals don't have that ability. You have the ability of learning how to use your hands to create things. You have the ability of learning how to solve a problem with your mind. Unlike a crude example of a YouTube video I seen one time of a raven who couldn't open up a nut, so he landed with the nut on top of a, a power line. And he sat there and waited for cars to drive by, and when the car would drive by, he would drop the nut and the car would run over it, and he would fly down and get the, in, the contents and then fly off. We have learned to be able not to rely on other things, but if we need something, we'll go out and we'll mold us a hammer and we'll make it ourselves and we will fix the problem. Unless you're like me and the water floods in your basement last night and you don't have a clue what to do, so you call your landlord. We, we have that ability with inside of ourselves because God placed it there, the care the divine essence in which God put inside of us. Uh, the Bible says that he created us in his own image. He loved us so much that he gave us the heartbeat of himself. Not only that, when we fail, he gave us a promise. See, man, we, we have this ability of not always understanding what our direction is supposed to be. A few weeks ago, my eight-year-old son was given into task. Take out the garbage. Now the garbage is less than five yards away from where he was taking it from to where he was taking it to. I stood him in the center of the kitchen and I said, Son, what is the first thing you are supposed to do when you get through taking out the trash? He said, put a garbage bag back in. I said, finally you've learned something. He walks outside, puts the trash in the trash can, comes back inside right into the living room and plays with the puppies. Not even five seconds of an instruction that was very specific. He could not follow. How much more is it when we as a human being and God gives us specific instructions uh, and we come to an altar and we say, God, I'll do whatever it is you've asked me to do and we walk right out the back door, we get into our cars, we head to the house in which we do not follow. But He gave us a promise that he would redeem the world. He looked at Adam and Eve as they stood there in their self-proclaimed new independence and he said woman thy seed <laughs> there's going to be a baby that's born just of a woman who's going to redeem the world he's going to be bruising he's going to be bruised but he's going to redeem the world you see there's there's an essence in which God looks at humanity and, and he says, I love them. I care for them. I made them. 
I want to see them succeed. I don't want to see them lost and undone. I, I don't want to see them uh, out there without the ability to drive or direct themselves. Uh, but I want to give them the direction they need in which I can take care of who they are. I don't know about you, but I don't like not knowing where I'm going. Now, you women quit laughing at me. I'm not like most men. I do have a GPS on my phone, and I use it quite regularly. And if I don't know where it's going, I'll say stop, and let's ask directions. Now, yesterday, my wife knew where she was going, and we turned down three wrong roads before we got there, before we called somebody. I know where I'm going. Just call somebody. I know where I'm going. I like to have direction. I like to have the knowledge. I like to see which direction I'm supposed to go. I, I, I want to know where I'm ending. I, I want to know that there's going to be a better place. Uh, if I have hope in this life, only I'm all, all men most miserable. If all I have is to wake up in the morning, shave my face, uh, wash it, walk out to work, gather a paycheck, come back home, go to bed, go to sleep, only to do it over again. Uh, I'm just a miserable person. Uh, but friend of mine, that's not what I have. Uh, I've got a promise that one day I'm going to be able to walk on streets of gold and through gates of pearls uh, right into the throne room of God uh, and throw my crown at his feet uh, and let him know that I love him and I care for him because he has done everything for me. But God wants to deliver people. You find how much he wants to deliver them when he goes to a man in the, out of a burning bush and he says, Moses, I, I have heard the cry of my people and I have asked you to go deliver them. God and Moses have an argument right there that I can't do this. I don't have the ability. I, 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 I'm slow as speech. I, 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 I can't think who is it that I'm supposed to say. All of these things transpire. And yet God still says, you're going to do it. Why? Because he couldn't stand the cries of his people any longer. <laughs> I sit back and, and I see people flying flags to unknown gods and I see them flying planes in the buildings of unknown gods and I, I see them worshiping in, in Hindu of, of unknown gods and I, I see them putting Twinkies at the statue of a fat man I, 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 of unknown gods. I see them doing these things everywhere you go and you prosper in life. Now it's kind of funny the other day we went to a Chinese restaurant, and, and you know, they, they have the statue of Buddha there. A everywhere you see Buddha. And I walked in the bathroom, and they had Christian music flowing. It's the first Christian Buddha, Buddhist I've ever ran into. But people are so, you know, they're, they're so... So many thoughts and religion processes out there that, that they, they're constantly asking and wondering and wanting to know what makes you any different than what I have here. I have my faith. You have your faith. You believe what you want to believe, and I'll believe what I want to believe. But, friend of mine, I don't believe this way because I read it in a book. I, I believe this way because I found it in an altar. And when I was lost and undone, uh, and I had no way of knowing which direction to go, uh, there was a God that met me in that altar. And he said, you don't have to be alone any longer. I'll walk with you. I'll go with you. And yea, though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you shall fear no evil, for I am with you. Moses decides he'll listen to the Lord. He goes. I don't know how long it took for the plagues to take place and finally for Pharaoh to say, take them and get out of here. I don't know if it was a month. I don't know if it was two months, six months, a year. I'm not sure. But I do know this, that not only did Moses experience the plagues from a distance, but there was a miraculous covering of the land of Goshen in which he stood. 
that they could see the plagues happen outside, but those plagues would not enter in where they were. That would be amazing to me, that just the plague of darkness, for example. You're standing there, and you've got the beautiful sunlight here, but where their land begins, it's completely dark. And they can't see a thing, but you can. Or the locusts, for example, are flying in, and all of a sudden, when they get to the land of Goshen, they do a Y, and they split and go around. But when it came to the plague of blood on the doorpost, it wasn't divided by land. It was whoever accepted the love. <laughs> Had to apply the blood in order to show that you're accepting the love that I'm sending your direction. So therefore, Moses and the children of Israel experienced putting the blood on the doorpost in order to say, God, I'm one of yours. I'm willing to accept this deliverance that you're going to give us. But they weren't gone very long until they get to a crossroad in which a river is in front of them, Pharaoh's army is behind them, uh, mountains on either side, and they turn around and they look at Moses and say, why did you bring us out here? We had it much better with the taskmasters. But you brought us out here to give us a mass grave. And yet again, God has to deliver. They weren't through that very long until they get to the foot of Mount Sinai and Moses is out of sight for just a little while. And they melt all their gold and make their own God. Every day was a miracle because they never got a hole in their shoe. Their clothes grew on their back. Every morning that they woke up, except for the Sabbath day, God had created and baked in the, in the bakeries of heaven fresh manna for them and laid it at their feet for however much they wanted to eat. And when they complained about that, he sent the, the, the other birds to bring them meat and give them something to eat. Uh, he, he, he took care of them for 40 years. And yet they still complained that it wasn't enough. Kind of like those spoiled children you see in, in Walmart. I hate taking my kids shopping. You give them $5, it takes them an hour to pick out a toy for $5. When you gave me $5 as a kid, I knew exactly what I wanted, what I was going to get when I got there. Because I didn't have very much. So when I went, it, it, it was, wow. But see, my kids have so much, I've spoiled them to death. They, you know, they got this, they got that, they got this, they got that. It's, it's kind of like, okay, well, I've got all this. What else can I buy for $5? Then it becomes, well, Dad, this is $10. Can I have this? No, you got $5. Well, there ain't nothing in the $5 market I like. But you give them a quarter and let them go over there to that quarter machine and they'll pie everything in there. Go, look at this little frog I got. It don't do nothing, but it sits there. Sometimes I wonder if we, we, we treat God like we're in a mall and we're saying, God, I, I, I really would like to have this and I'd really like to have that. And we get down on our knees and we pray about, well, God, I'd really like this or I'd really like that and so on and so forth. And he loves us so much uh, that he desires to give us the desires of our heart. But sometimes the answer is not what you really want to hear. So we sulk up. Well. If I can't have it and they can, I'll just quit. I'll take my ball and go home. But he still loves us. You know how, how spoiled my kids are? I still try to buy them something for Christmas they want because I love them. And if a man knows how to give his earthly children good gifts, how much more does the heavenly father that has every hair on your head numbered? See, when my kid wants to lose a tooth and they're scared, I want to put them in a headlock and pull it out for them. God's not like that. He didn't put us in a headlock and say, okay, you're going bald. I'm going to pull all your hair out. No, he knows that 9,543 just washed down the drain. 
He's got them numbered. He knows you better than you know yourself. He knows that you've got 5,000 hairs in your hairbrush and you haven't cleaned it out in months uh, because he's got them numbered. He knows the skin cells that are in your vacuum cleaner because he created them. He knows. We can't do things by ourselves. God delivered a nation in spite of their being spoiled. Yeah, he took out the first generation and he let the second generation go in only because the first generation said, we can't do this, they're too big. There's not a mountain too high or a valley too low. There's not any kind of international space station too far that if you're there, my God can't reach you and take care of you and give you the answers that you need in the midst of your situation. There's not cancer. There's not congestive heart failure. There's not any kind of sin that would keep God from taking care of you. It doesn't make a difference what you've done, where you've been, where you've gone. If you get down on your knees and say, God, just one more time let me hear what you've got to say I'm going to tell you that God will run to where you are just like the prodigal in which when he was coming home God didn't wait or the father didn't wait for him to get to the house he left his seat and ran to where he was all you have to do is to make sure you're willing to go home They didn't want the judges that God had given. They wanted a king. So God gave them a king. The first king didn't do what he was supposed to do, so God anointed another one. This king came out of the field, but when he was in the office of the king, he forgot his field experience. Something about being in that office when he was supposed to be at war, yet we find him on the rooftop looking out, doing and wishing he had something that didn't belong to him. And then we find him praying and crying when the prophet come and said, you've done this, David. You're the one that made the mistake. And David in a, in a pile of ashes, uh, he, he's praying and he's crying and he's begging God to forgive him. Yet, process of this if this had been a preacher in today's society we would have cast him out he wouldn't have been welcome in our churches anymore we would have said they're not worthy of the of even being in amongst us saints because they've done such a wrong they got up there and preached the gospel they led us and and they failed but the new testament says david was a man after god's own heart <laughs> what a love that church what a love. How special is that, Brother Jared? That, that, that a man that had fallen in the worst sin that we think is possible. He had committed adultery and murder in the process of covering up the adultery and taking somebody else's wife to be his, and yet God says he's a man after God's own heart. Why? Because he didn't justify his actions. Boy, everybody else is doing it. No. He ran and fell down in an altar. He, he repented of, it, of what was going on. He, he, he began to cry out to God and let God be his judge and his answer. Friend of mine, let me preach to you about the love of God. It doesn't make a difference what you've done, where you've gone, where you've been. If you just will accept the love of God, there's nothing that God is going to hold against you. 4,000 years. And God was saying, hold on, I'm coming. Isaiah 9 and 6 gives us a very profound prophecy about 2,000 years before Jesus Christ is born or maybe 1,000 years 
But it says unto this, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. What the Lord was preaching and prophesying at that point is saying everything that you're going through, I've got something that's wonderful that's going to cover it. If you need counseling, I'm a counselor. I'm the Mighty God. I'm the Everlasting Father, and I'm the the Prince of Peace. There's nothing in your soul that can keep you from me if you'll just wait on me to get there. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength and they shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall walk and not be weary. They shall run and not faint. Oh, friend of mine, if we had just learned to wait upon the Lord uh, and not try to do things of our own accord, that's what gets us in a mess sometimes. Uh, that's what gets us in problems. Uh, we can't wait. We're a microwave generation. i got to have it right now. Now, I'm going to confess a sin here. It reminds me of a story this one time when this preacher got up behind the pulpit and he was preaching and everybody was asleep. He said, I'm going to confess a fault unto you right now. Everybody perked up and he said, I spent the half, half the years of my life in the arms of another man's wife. Everybody just sat there and they looked at him and they began to whisper and, you know, and thing went over the crowd and he said and that other woman was my mother well this young preacher out there he, he thought that was pretty cool so he wrote that down right a few years later he was preaching but listen he, he preached and he said they was all falling asleep on him he said I, I, I'm going to use that thing that guy said he said I, I've got a confession to make and they all perked up and he said, Half the years of my life was spent in the arms of another man's wife. Well, same reaction. They all began to whisper and, and this, that, and the other. And he just stood there. He forgot who the other woman was. I got a confession to make. I hate Marsha spaghetti. I, I'm from the South. I like it to have all the garlic and the peppers and the onions and, you know. But there's one thing she does that I do differently that I, I actually enjoy. Even though I don't like the sugar, I put some garlic in there to overcome it, so I, I, I begin to enjoy it, and, and so I take it for lunch a lot of times. But but the thing that I, I, I like about it is she actually spends time on it. She didn't just throw it together. You know, like, it's not like ragu, it's in there. She actually puts it in there. Now, me, I'm a ragu type guy. I go get it with the garlic and stuff and put it in there, and, and, and I enjoy it. But she actually takes the time to make the meat and fry the meat and do all this stuff and make her spaghetti. God's not a microwave type God. You can't just go to the freezer of God and pull out a hungry jack man and put it in the microwave and get your substance. Sometimes it's got to cook and simmer. Sometimes it's got to be prepared. Sometimes uh, there's a service that he's cooking just for you that if you will wait upon him, uh, when you walk into that service, uh, you will feel the answer that God wants to give you if you will just wait. That holy night, after 4,000 years of prophecy, after prophecy, after prophecy, there was a cry that the world had heard uh, that nobody had ever heard before. The world, the angels, the animals, and the stars stood at attention as real love entered into the darkness of the deep uh, and moved upon the faces of the waters of the heart. Uh, the Bible says in Psalms 42 and 7 uh, that the deep calleth unto the deep uh, at the noise of the water spouts. Uh, all thy waves and thy billows are gone. 
gone over me. Friend of mine, when Jesus Christ entered into the world, uh, he answered the call of the deep, uh, dark heart saying, I'm ready to be delivered. And when he cried that night uh, as a baby boy, and he rose and he grew in wisdom and stature, it was so that you and I could have an opportunity to be saved. How beautiful as it was that on that night when a friend come looking for answers that he looks at him and he says if you're born of the water and of the spirit you can enter the kingdom of God. How is it that I can be born again? It's real easy. Just listen to what I'm saying. Don't think of it in fleshly tones. Think of it in spiritual tones. And then he goes on to say in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world. And he uses a very specific word in that scripture that he says that they should not perish. Now, my kids should do what I ask them to do, but they don't always do it. There are many translations out there that say, that you would not perish. Would means that God's not going to allow you to perish if you believe. That's not what the Scripture says. The Scripture says they should not. Meaning that there are a lot of people out there that are going to believe and they shouldn't perish, but they're going to because they fail to continue in instruction. Very specific. They should not perish, but they should have everlasting life. I believe that I'm going to, if I stand out in the middle of the road, I'm going to get hit by a bus. That means I shouldn't stand out there. But you see idiots that do it all the time. I should not perish. I should be born again. I should be born of the water and the spirit. Well, Brother Eves, I believe. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. And then finally, I'm getting to a close here. Jesus wept. You see, to me, this is one of the most powerful verses in Scripture when we see the actual humanity of God. Well, let me explain to you what's going on at this moment. He had gotten word that one of his friends was dying. And Jesus continues to do what he's doing in the city in which he's in because he wants to see God glorified. Then he looks over his disciples a couple of days later. Last night, we had a uh, water leak in our house, and I had to get up in the ceiling, and there was something up in that ceiling that's got my sinuses all messed up today. There was a, there was a, a situation that took place in which Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, Let's go, for Lazarus is asleep. And them not understanding what he's talking about, saying, Well, isn't sleep good for him? No, you don't understand. He's dead. And when he gets there, he's met in the road by Martha. Martha saying, if you had only been here, Jesus, he wouldn't have died. Martha, he's going to live again. They had seen all the miracles that Jesus had done. They'd been a part of them. But for some reason, when it comes to us, we have less faith. We have faith for somebody else that has cancer, but when it comes to us, we, we just don't have as much faith. We have faith for somebody else to be saved, but when it comes to us, we have a little bit of less faith. She says, yeah, I know he's going to rise again in the resurrection, but, you know, this is too late now, Jesus. Mary comes out. He's going to live again. Oh, I know he will one day. Jesus begins to cry. 
because the only one that had faith in what he was able to do was him that day. Friend of mine, you don't need a church to have faith in you. We need our church, and hopefully our churches are doing what they're supposed to be doing. But if every one of us in here are hypocrites and that's the only reason you're not serving God, then that's not a good reason. Because everybody around there knew what Jesus was able to do, but none of them had faith in him at that moment. So therefore, technically, they could be classified as a hypocrite. The only one that had faith in the ability of that man to walk out of that grave was Jesus Christ himself. Because he knew why he was there. And even when he gets to the tomb, he says, roll away the stone. And they look at him and they say, but he's been dead for four days. He stinks. <laughs> Feliciano, I'm not doing that. <laughs> that. That dude, he, he messed up in there. It's dark. There's some ugly stuff crawling on that man. You don't you don't want this to happen, Lord. Roll it away anyway. Can you imagine the ability of the power in which Jesus when he spoke? That he didn't just say come out, but he called him by name. I'm just one of those type of guys that believe that if he had said come out, every one of them would have opened up. But he spoke them specifically by name. And the guy comes hopping out of the grave. There's still something the church has to do because Jesus says unbind him and take the napkin off his face and loose him. See, that's what our job is. It's not our job to save them. It's not our job to, 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 to try to get them to do what God asked them to do. That's, that's between them and God. But our job is when they come out and God's delivering them, not to push them back down and say, you were dead, there's nothing here you can do anymore. You were lost, you, you had left God, you, you had left and went on your own. No, our job is to take them and take the binds off of them, loose them, uh, get them back prepared into a place uh, in which they can serve God on a regular basis. Uh, friend of mine, let me tell you something, the love of God is much deeper and brighter and bigger than we can ever imagine if we will just take a hold of his words. Lazarus was rotten and decaying and yet at the words of Jesus he comes out loosed and full of love. And my last point as he comes to the music is the ultimate act of love Jesus had been taken and beaten unmercifully. He was battered and he was broken. He was bleeding and he had been nailed to a tree. And you could say that's all love. That's all he had to show. But Paris, he went a step further. And he pushes up and he looks out across the crowd. And here's the amazing thing about the crowd is a lot of them had been in the things that Jesus had spoke about. I mean, you just don't walk into this town with 5,000 people following you and them not see some of the things that you had done for people. And yet they're out there crying, crucify him, crucify him. Let his blood be upon us and our shoulders and our children. Kill him. Get rid of him. Snuff him out. He pushes up one more time. And he says, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Scripture is very specific when it says, Greater love hath no man than this that a man lay down his life for his friends. Let 
you, you don't understand the love in which Jesus had. Because really, you deserve to die. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all lost. The only difference between me and the drunk is that I've accepted the love of God and he's yet to accept it. That's the only difference. I'm no better than he is. I put my pants on just like he does. I'm a few minutes away from any type of mess up if I'm not careful. But it's the love of God that keeps me. It's the love of God that I that I fall into and that I bask in. Then he gives up the ghost. There's an earthquake. Lightning. Thunder. As he lays there and he's dead. But nobody claims the body. And there was one man... The Bible names him by name. His name was Joseph of Arimathea. He goes to Pilate and he begs for the body of Jesus. And he and Nicodemus take the body. Think about this for just a moment. In Jesus' last moments, the very ones that had walked with him for three and a half years don't even come to his cross to take him. But another man stands up and says, I'll do it. Let me have him. I'll take him. Friend, let me preach to you about the love of God. Oh, If there's somebody in this place today that says, I understand what he's done and I'll take him. Let me have Jesus. I want him. There's nothing like in this story to understand this. That oftentimes the ones that are in service with him all the time, we fail to realize because we get so callous to it, we we fall back on it so much that we, we get... A little bit under the comfort zone, if we sort of speak. But there's somebody in this building today that you're feeling what I'm preaching to you and you understand something, that there was a greater love that Jesus had given to you that was bigger than anything. And you want so bad to say, let me have him. I'll take him. Let me put on Jesus. Let me do what he's called me to do. Let me follow after him. As we all stand, every head bowed, every eye closed. If Jesus took your sins, you don't have to look at where you are or where you came from. You just have to look to where you're going. Because He can invade the dark, deep, lost soul of your heart and give you something to satisfy it. He can give you something that will fill your heart. It doesn't make a difference how old or how young you are today. It doesn't make a difference where you've been or what you've gone through. Maybe you used to be a part of the church. And maybe, just maybe, you, you've kind of gotten a little cold. That's okay. He can heat the fire back up. He can put you back on the right path. He can put you back in the place in which He wants you. That's who God is. Maybe you're in here today and you're, you're feeling a little bit lost and you don't have the direction you want. That's okay. He can do that for you as well. For He's our deliverer. He's our King. He's our Savior. He's our God. God's not hanging hanging you over the pits of hell by a string waiting to cut the cord and get rid of you. 
No, it's not who God is. God's actually sitting at the edge of his throne saying if they'll just take one step, <laughs> just one step, I'll take the rest. That's who God is. We're going to open up these altars this morning because I believe there's some people in here today that just want to come and just get a hold of Jesus. And it's anybody. This isn't just for, you know, guests or visitors. This ain't for the church folks. This is whoever this morning says, I understand what you're preaching about, preacher, and I just want to get a hold of Jesus. Would you come this morning? Here we go. God bless this one. There's others. I'll oh, bless these. Let me get a hold of Jesus. I want him in my heart. I want him. Let me take him on. Oh, God bless him. God bless him. Let me have him. Let me take him. Saints, would you gather behind these this morning? Would you come pray for some of these that are around here this morning? Oh, hallelujah.
Yes. 